Well, thank you. Those are those are fun uh, things to look at. Um, uh, that especially, I mean, I have to give uh, credit to Harold. Harold said, "Why don't you? Uh, why don't we set up something and you can? We'll set up something for you to rack and how about?" And I said, "Why don't you just set up? Uh, I don't know how we did it, but we sort of agreed to set up some flowers." And then, uh, and Tootsie, that was, you know, that's Dustin Hoffman being, you know, really, really great. And I got to play this character that was uh, tossed into this Murray Shisco, Larry Gelbart script. She said, "How about if, uh, how about if Dustin has a roommate?" You know, and that was that was it. That was pretty much it. And uh, and. Uh, it, it just it just came very naturally from there. It, it was, I sort of represented audience point of view of this man, mm -hmm. a roommate dressed as a woman with the poles pulling back his face and stuff. And to see Dustin with all these like middle aged, uh, you know, nightmares, facial uh, procedures done to his face every day. You know, it just it gave you a lot of confidence that you could get uh, humor out of it. And, you know, wearing girdles and so forth. You know. But it was a lot of fun. That was a great. A uh, great uh, group of people. That was. Um, I'm, I'm going to blank on everyone's name, so I, I apologize. For well, Sydney, Sydney no. Pollack. Well, I remember Sydney Pollack. I'm trying to think. Oh, Terry Gar. That's who it is outside the door. But they don't see her face. I'm having to just hear her voice. Terry Gar is outside the door, and George Gaines is this fellow who plays the Lothario. And I, I tried never to crack up in a movie. That was the only guy that ever ever really got me. He was so <laughs> funny. I, I had I had like the Danny Thomas spit take all over myself one time. <laughs> he didn't take it was impossible to 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 control myself. He was as a funny man, that guy. He was really funny. Uh, now, as you had just come from uh, improv comedy, uh, Second City, and then you did some, uh, some work in New York, and then you got on Saturday Night Live, which famously has a live studio audience. You were used to the immediate feedback of that crowd. Uh, was there any kind of an adjustment being on a movie set or a movie soundstage where you know you didn't have that that kind of uh, reaction? Well, the hard, the most difficult thing is that you tell a joke or you say something funny, and no one laughs. For nine months, <laughs> and, you, and you forget you have this incomplete feeling in your gut. They're like, wait, so, something's wrong. Why am I not sleeping correctly? You know, why am I? And then when you go to the movie, you realize, oh, I said something funny a long time ago, and no one laughed. And then when you see it in an audience, it's like, oh, thank God that's over. What a what a relief that was. Um, that particular movie was a funny one because they were. Uh, you know, the people talk about how important it is to have friction on movies that it creates real quality. Well, Dustin and Sydney went to war every single day. It was just, <laughs> it was hilarious, really. It was really hilarious to watch because they would argue, you know, about the sun. Is it up or is it down? Is it, is it day? You know, what time of day is it? They'd argue about everything. And it was great. It, it caused every moment to be alive, every shooting moment to be alive, that you had to really, and um, when I get the, got there, they were, they, they, it, it had already been in the New York Times that the movie was weeks over budget, millions of dollars over budget, and a disaster, an unqualified disaster. So when I got there, the crew was hiding, pretty much hiding from both Sydney and, and Dustin, sort of way <laughs> far away over there on the other side of the big New York City loft. And I thought, what the heck's going on here? This is really odd. Because I'm used to people being around the camera. That's where the action is. Mm -hmm. And you can make a crew laugh. A crew knows how to, I mean, occasionally someone will laugh out loud, but they know how to not laugh too. And without the crew there, it was very hard. So I had to, I had to like just stir it up and take turns. And one day I'd be on Sydney's side, one day I'd be on Dustin's side. They didn't know what was going on. And it sort of brought everyone back to the camera to watch Hey, maybe this, maybe there's something, you know, just to know what was happening today. And once that began, you know, you got to have the crew. If you don't have the crew, you're, you're really dead. And that's part of the yeah. reason the movie was so, uh, you know, fractured 
because the crew was, you know, they, they're both wonderful people, Sydney and Dustin, but they were both, you know, they were clanging like this about everything. And mm -hmm. it's a New York City crew. The guys are so cool. They've seen pretty much everything and they're, they'll accept anything, but they don't want to see people fight for too. They just didn't, they just mm -hmm. sort of backed way up. And it was fun to get everyone back in and have really a lot of fun. And, and after just a little bit of time, I just said, this guy's, you gotta know, this is gonna be really big. This is gonna be a really big, successful, wonderful movie. And it is, it's a great, it's a great uh, idea. It's, and it's, I mean, it's not the first time a man played a woman in either theater or a movie, but it's really well uh, executed, you know, and everybody's, everybody, you know, uh, all, the, all the actors and actresses really brought it every single day. It was very competitive, very, in, in a good way. That way I can do this. Yeah. Okay, I can do this. I can do this. I can do this. Mm -hmm. Just really pushing yourselves like, how, 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 what, how much more can we throw at this thing? And still make, make, you know, not lose the premise. You know? Well, that, that film is just a bullseye. And I do remember seeing it with an audience when it was new. And it, it was just a, a, a tremendously funny movie. Uh, with with, uh, uh, with some backbone, uh, you know. Yeah, it, it had some, you know, it was women's rights by men, you know, in some, in, yeah. to some degree, by some you know, telling. But, you know, those were pretty educated fellas. And having Elaine May's sort of angel on your shoulder kind of made everybody their best their best person, their best writer, actor, and director. Mm -hmm. And everybody was so, I mean, Sidney Pollack is so funny as an actor in that. I just, you know, I missed that guy because he was such a funny guy. You know, he was such a, I really got to like him more and more and more. When I first met him, I'm like, who's the guy in the denim and the cowboy boots? Is, it, we, is this really a movie? But I got to really love that guy. And I really, I really miss him. He was, he was, uh, he was, not afraid of the of the unknown. He was he would take some real risks. He also mentored a lot of people. I know a great many people miss him for a variety of good reasons. Um, we're moving on now to Ghostbusters, nineteen eighty four. Uh, again, Ivan Reitman's directing, and the screenplay was by Dan Aykroyd and Harold Ramis. Now. Do they, when you're going to work with these guys who you know and who you trust and who you're comfortable with, do they encourage you to ad lib? Do they expect you to improvise? Uh, or, or do they want you to do all that before you, sh you, you shoot and so they know what, what's coming? Well, I don't, I don't know how you'd really do it before unless you were writing it, but those. Those fellas, because we were, we, you know, we rehearsals for losers. I think we all know that, right? Rehearsals for losers, and uh, <laughs> we would just like to get out there and do it. And it was fun. And until you're, I mean, a script is two dimensions, you know, and a script can be as good as it can be. But when you enter the physical world and you have to stand, move, walk, and talk, something arrives that's unexpected and unaccounted for. And that's where you, um, that's where you you make your bones is, is what happens there. Because, you know, a movie that's sort of lifeless is one where sometimes where it's the script is all you get. The script is all you get. The actors give you the script and they don't, they don't take into it all that's happening in the moment of the real shooting. There's, there's a lot going on in this moment now that, that I'm not getting. You know, and, and all three of us aren't getting, you know, but the more you can um, notice it, be aware of it and, and, and sort of transmit that, the more alive the, the, the scene becomes, the, the more alive the film becomes. And that, that movie had great, uh, great cinematography, of course, Laszlo Kovacs. That's a, you know, a lot of special effects movies, they look pretty, pretty, pretty weak nowadays. But that movie still's got a real look to it. That's pretty, pretty legit. It was ahead of its time. We had great, 
we had great special effects people. I can't come up with anyone's name at the moment, but they were they were really good, and Lava was really good, and and they liked us. You know, it was a hard job, um, and Lazo was has had a wonderful sense of humor, and the the, the four of us, Ernie Hudson and 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 Danny and Harold, we knew we were we we're going to sink or swim together, so we were always looking out for each other. We were, we were constantly making sure that everybody's like pumping here and we're all, we're all getting it. As far as improvising goes, um, you know, Harold maybe designated some, uh, he, that, that Egon was the, the mind, the brain of the Ghostbusters and that Danny was the heart of the Ghostbusters and that uh, um, and, and, and Ernie was the soul of the Ghostbusters and that uh, Peter Bankman was the mouth of the Ghostbusters. So I got to, I got to talk a lot. And when those, when it gets to, be a movie when the special effects start to rear their ugly head, you know, then that's when I had to sort of work a little bit. That's when I had to earn my money to earn my keep to uh, sort of comment on it as, as a, you know, once again, probably as an audience member, but as a, as a, as a sort of wiseacre of our group that it's to, in order to keep some sort of courage or false courage up about what we were going after, which we were truly terrified of. I mean, even the, even the sets were scary to us. Really, they were. It was a frightening, you know, the electricity, the all, all those kinds of things. The the stunts were really kind of scary and dangerous. I mean, I've done most of my stunts all my life, but um, but one I said I wasn't going to do because it was a wire stunt, and the, and the stunt fell. Said, "Oh, I'll handle this one," and he flew so far up in the air and landed on with his crotch right on the corner of this, uh, this marble table. And I just thought, you know, I, you know, I, I don't, I'm not always right, but boy, when I'm right like that, you really feel like you must always be right. It was, yeah. it was a very painful moment. And you can see it in the movie that when the fella hits the table, because I, if, it, if that had been I hitting the table, you'd have heard an unbelievable scream. I, I think, uh, I don't, I don't know what I'm talking about anymore. I just think of how uh, I've, I've cheated death in the film business, and I, and I cheated manhood that day in the, in the film business. <laughs>